I came across an article in the Pontypool Free Press from 1907, and this story is based on that article. It is centred upon my grandfather, Philip Young, who was born in 1876. One of this family, you see there his father, Samuel, with the beard, and his mother, Martha. Samuel was a blacksmith and worked in the iron and steel industry in Blindhaven. The family worshipped until 1885 at Old James Street, Wesleyan Chapel, and then in 1885 the whole congregation moved to a new chapel in Park Street, and that is where they worshipped. But my grandfather Philip was sent to Sunday school, fooled around and went there to disturb what was going on. So he made himself something of a nuisance at Sunday school. By 1901, they were living at number seven, Barnfield Terrace. And there you see the house some years later, on both the left and the right. And on the right, you see Philip's second son, Dinsdale, my father. And you see me standing at the door of number seven, Barnfield Terrace in Blynavon. And my grandfather at that time was a coal miner and a hewer. As a young man, he went astray in some ways. He went and got sworn into the army at Bryn Mawr in 1894. He didn't like it, borrowed a pound to buy himself out. But he developed a craving for drink. And he says, I drank and drank. He took on gambling. He lost money. He had to take his watch and chain to a pawn shop in order to get more money. And he was powerless to stop drinking, although he tried. So he even stole coal from his father to sell for beer in the 1898 strike. In 1899, he was too drunk to go to bed when he got home on one occasion and simply fell asleep on the floor. Here is one of the pubs that he drank at. And Willie Aston, a Blind Avon man, wrote to me in 1977 and said, as a young man, Philip took to drink. One Saturday evening, he was drinking in the Forge Hammer public house when a young Salvation Army lass named Alice Gameson came in. She said to him, Phil, I'm sorry to see you here. Come out, Phil. He did so and started to go to chapel again. Alice went with him, and he often told of it. He told of the awful battle he had to keep out of the public house, the very smell of the beer and sawdust as he passed a public house was like a magnet to steel, and he had almost to run past to avoid going in again. But he held firm and became a local preacher for many years, whose services were always in demand. And there you see him as a young man. And just now you saw a picture of the Forge Hammer, one of the places where he drank. He, in fact, married that Salvation Army lass, so she became my grandmother. Now, in 1901, the South Wales Gazette mentions him in an article which you see there in the middle of that slide. And it tells us that he was working at Milbrine Pit in Nantaglore. The pit was worked by the aid of open lamps. And my grandfather and, of course, his workmates worked with naked lights. And there was a danger if there was an accumulation of gas. The article also mentions that he was described as a hard-working man. Well, he began to preach, as Willie Aston said. He started to preach in 1901, and he was fully accredited as a local preacher in the Wesleyan Connection in 1903. And here you see the places where he preached during the first calendar year of his accreditation. Llanelli Hill, Abbasachan, Race, Cwm Avon, Cwm Bran, Vartek, Pushti, Victoria, Pontypool, Park Street, Blynavon, Griffithstown, Pont Newydd, Clydach and Gandiffith. He and his family were still living at number seven, Barnfield Terrace, and 
These photographs were taken in 1906 or thereabouts, and you see him standing there with a bicycle, and on the bicycle is my father. And there on the right you see him with Alice Maud, his wife, and their first few children. And then in January 1907, he went and took a meeting at the Wesleyan Social Class in Pontypool. And the entire text of his talk was reported in the Pontypool Free Press. And I'm going to read to you now a few extracts from it, because this tells us, I think, what sort of man he was, what sort of God he believed in, and what sort of thing he talked about when he was speaking as a local preacher amongst the Wesleyan Methodists. See the human love that is expressed for the wandering son or daughter, the child who has gone into the far country, and may be by the swine's trough. It is for that one the true mother weeps oftenest at the feet of God, this is love which time cannot change, nor failing strength make faint. The hair may grow white with anxiety, the eyes once bright grow dim, the footsteps once light and fleet become feeble, but beneath the tottering clay love still burns, quenchless and immortal, the love for her child. Dr. Fitchett tells a familiar story of such a mother, it might be told of many a mother, who lay dying. Her eyes had lost their power of seeing, her ears their faculty of hearing, the voice of the minister while he prayed at her bedside, the sound of her name from her husband's lips sent no vibration to the brain, drowned by the stupor of fast-coming death. But while those who stood round her bed were in the hush of grief, waiting for the last fluttering breath from the dying lips, suddenly from the next room, there arose the voice of a weeping child, and the mother heard. It was as though her soul turned back on the dim ways of death at the call of her child's voice. Let us suppose such a mother in heaven. Her feet tread the streets of gold, the chant of the angels fills her ears. She sees the face of God, she is clad in fine linen, the garment of the saints. And suddenly she hears in that darkness which lies outside the gates of heaven, the sound of her child's voice lamenting, the voice of her firstborn son, of the daughter on whose cheek she grudged the wind to blow too roughly. What at such a moment, and at the sound of such a call, would be the impulse of love, love even in the imperfect form in which it dwells in the human heart. It would be to leave the streets of gold and the chants of saints, and to go with outstretched hands and hastening feet into that outer darkness in search of her lost and lamenting child. Love, so strong and tender, though it may be imperfect, is nothing else but God's gift to mankind. And has he nothing in his own nature which corresponds to it? Yes, God is love. Are we then going to agree with men who will assert that God is too busy keeping the universe in order, in all its vastness, to take notice of his own yearning, lamenting children, whose language is, oh, that I knew where I might find him? God forbid. Then we say that the incarnation and descent of the eternal Son of God into suffering human life is the expression of infinite love, Yes, the love of a heavenly father towards his obstinate, sinful and lost children. We must own that God possesses and possesses in the measure of his being what he has given us, namely, love. Then too, we say the revelation of God to man in the gift of his son is something more than credible. It is inevitable. For love conquers all difficulties, surmounts all barriers. Hear him saying by one of his servants, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Here then truly is love's sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or as the poet puts it, here is love in mighty torrents. As an illustration of the folly of unbelief in these things, just allow me a word or two upon it. There is a description given of it in the first chapter of Romans, 
Those people were given over unto a reprobate mind, because that which was known of God was manifest to them. But they denied it, and as a result, they were left destitute, for God left them. Much better it will be if we make God our portion while on earth, with our trust all centred in him. Yes, our life hid with Christ in God. And doing this while life shall last, we shall then with good John Wesley, when passing from this world into the next, say, Best of all, God is with us. And here you see a text which talks about that love of God, which God himself compares to the love of a mother. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have graven you on the palms of my hands. Now, he grew old probably before his time and died in his 50s. Here you see him with his family around him, but he had inhaled so much coal dust when he was working as a coal miner that it brought on a fairly early death. So he died earlier than perhaps should have happened if he had not breathed in all that coal dust and got silicosis in his lungs. And when he lay dying in 1933, the doctor who attended him commented that he wished he might die with the peace that my grandfather had in dying. And there you see his grave. You can read the words, Philip Young. His wife Alice is buried in the same grave. And on his grave are the words, Forever with the Lord. Now, if you'd like to read or hear more of a devotional nature or a biographical, historical, doctrinal talk or article, then visit this website and may you find blessing and help in visiting it. And may God bless you.